Well, hello there everybody and welcome back. It's Sally here with another Tuesday Teaching Tips. Now, last week I was talking about the piano framework and how I'd had a lovely summer working on that and really digging down into our piano framework, which is exclusive to the members of the community. And I said I'd come back and give you uh, a few hints and tips as, as the weeks go on. So I thought today, as so many people are, so many teachers are working with beginners coming for their very first lessons, often live lessons for the very first time. Um, it's I thought I'd focus on the very start of the piano framework, which is the beginners, beginner level one. And the level one framework, actually, it's, it's only one page long, this one. Um, because it's just about establishing musical skills. It's about establishing the musician in them. And the piano is just an instrument like any other instrument, but it's not a specific focus in these very, very early few lessons. And one of the first things, of course, to establish is the idea of um, pulse and rhythm. And in the piano framework, actually it's the very fourth concept in distinguishing between pulse and rhythm. Now, I think this is a really important stage that often gets overlooked. We often go straight in with rhythm, tapping rhythm or even reading rhythm. Whoa, be careful. Um, but first of all, before that can be really, really concrete, successful, we have to establish that their understanding of pulse and rhythm. So I'll just put that down for a moment. So one way that I would do this is I would spend a couple of lessons anyhow looking at the idea of pulse and getting children moving to the pulse, experiencing the pulse. We might put some music on. The Radetzky March, for example, is a fantastic piece to get them really moving around and marching to the beat. Uh, we might also do some some gentle, some simple rhymes like jelly on a plate, yeah? one of my favourites, and cobbler cobbler, all of which are in, my, of course, my ready to play book. There are lots of others as well, but so important that the children, these young children, sort of five, six, seven, younger still, um, need to establish this sense of pulse and feel the pulse before we can then bring on the idea of distinguishing between the rhythm and the pulse. And here's how I might do that. It's just one example, that's all. Um, I'm going to use a song. It goes like this. Mm, up I go, hey, hey, look at me. I am smiling, can you see? And the child would just answer me. I'm not going to go into teaching song today, but that's a very lovely little simple song. Of course, we could do marching. I go, hey, hey, look at me, I am marching, can you see? Now, once they know the song and are confident in singing it with you by themselves, you can then get rid of the pitch and just leave behind the rhythm and say, have a listen. My fingers are going to tap the rhythm pattern of the words. Off I go, hey, hey, look. Listen again to my fingers as they tap the rhythm pattern of the words. That's the secret phrase, by the way, rhythm pattern of the words. Just use it continuously and consistently and you'll find they'll get it. Off we go. Hey, hey, look at me. Notice I'm being very direct in my teaching. Beginners need direct teaching. You can't leave them guessing. Do you know what I call this? They probably don't. So, and they will feel dreadful and they will try and guess because they try to please all the time, don't they? So you are direct teaching to them. This is the rhythm pattern of the words. So you could do that. And then you could take that a little bit further and I could use my floor spots. Oh, I'm so, it's so much fun to have my floor spots out again and be using those in live lessons. I had them out the other day for the first time with somebody who hadn't used them before because she'd had lessons completely in lockdown. But today, because I haven't got that much space, I have got here some of my little ducky friends. Here they are. I'm just going to put that there. So I've got my four ducks and I can make this rhythm now a little more conscious for them. And the fact that we have one sound and two sounds. And I might say to them, have a listen to the rhythm now. Off I go. Hey, hey, look at me. Hmm. I wonder which of my ducks had two taps on the head. Have a listen. Off I go. Hey, hey, look at me. 
Now, it just so happens, and I didn't plan this, honest, but this duck is called Super Sally Duck. And it was brought to me by one, one of my pupils because they know I love ducks. So it would be Super Sally who has the two sounds. And then, of course, the pupil could come and also say the rhythm pattern of the words. The saying is important rather than singing because the pitch gets in the way. <laughs> yeah, They start to confuse the pitch and the rhythm. And so we're just saying the rhythm pattern of the words. Off we go. Hey, hey, look. Me. That is, of course, the very start of their journey in exploring rhythm. And yet it's making it conscious for them in a very um, experiential way. They are really, really experiencing that rhythm. It's tangible because we've got the, um, the ducks here. If I had the floor spots, I could also have some little manipulatives, <clears throat> like little little erasers, little rubbers, or some little uh, um, fuzzes, as people call them. And we put those on the floor spots, representing whether it has one sound or two sounds. Does it take time? Yes, it does. Do the children learn? Yes, they do. Do they understand? Yes, they do. Does it make their rhythm um, feeling, rhythm, reading? in later years more successful and more independent yes it does so time equals what does it equal time equals um real solid learning really solid learning because it's not just an abstract idea so just one idea from the piano framework distinguishing between pulse and rhythm i hope you've enjoyed that and find it useful to take into your teaching this afternoon or the rest of this week. Take care wherever you are. Bye for now.